Hello everyone, my name is Julie and thank you so much for joining us today. I organize the webinars here at the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women. If you're new to our organization, our mission is to prepare young women for effective leadership in the conservative movement and to promote leading conservative women. We do this through multiple ways. We host uh, webinars like this one, campus lectures across the country, summits, and our intensive internship program here in the office. Um, if you'd like to learn more about us, you can visit our website at cblwomen.org and follow us on our social media platforms at the handle CBL Women. Joining me today is one of our center's summer interns, Caroline Sear. Caroline is from St. Louis and is a rising senior at the University of Dallas. She's majoring in politics with a concentration in legal studies. We are so thankful to have Caroline with us this summer. Thank you for joining us today as we host Diana West. Diana West is an award-winning journalist and the author of multiple books, including The Red Thread, A Search for Ideological Drivers Inside the Anti-Trump Conspiracy, American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character, and The Death of the Grown-Up, How America's Arrested Development is Bringing Down Western Civilization. A journalist since graduating from Yale, West began writing a weekly newspaper column at the Washington Times, where she also wrote editorials. Her column would be nationally syndicated for 15 years. Her work has appeared in many publications and news sites, including The American Spectator, Breitbart News, The Daily Caller, and the Epoch Times. West has made numerous television, documentary, and radio appearances and has addressed audiences all around the world. Today, Diana will be speaking on the communist march through American institutions during the 20th century and how it still affects us today. Please join me in welcoming Diana West. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you. Shall I start now? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Oh, great. I just wanted to start with uh, a quick anecdote about Claire Booth Luce. I'm very happy to be at, at the Center for Conservative Women in her name. I actually had a harmonic convergence with Mrs. Luce many years ago when I was a, a young reporter at the Washington Times. It was the late 1980s. I had the plum assignment of interviewing the field of Republican presidential candidates. So this was primary time. And one day, I, they, these would be featured, the Washington Times used to have a big uh, uh, feature section called Capital Life. And one day, I, I have, one of my features was up. It was actually on uh, former Secretary of State Al Haig, who was running. And that day, Claire Booth Luce came to the paper to have lunch with our editor-in-chief, Arno de Borgrav, who is a legendary journalist of the 20th century. And they arrived on the mezzanine overlooking the big bullpen newsroom that we had out there adjacent to the National Arboretum, very stunning building if you've ever been there or worked there. And anyway, I suddenly started hearing my own name, uh, Diana what? Diana, Diana. And I looked up and it was Claire Booth Luce pointing at me, holding my, my story up in her hand, standing there with Arno, our, our editor, and I waved at her and she waved at me. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of this great moment. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to meet her, but it was uh, very nice to be recognized by her. And all these decades later, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, my subject today is uh, based on the research I've been doing really for the past 10 years or more that led to my book, American Betrayal, which came out in 2013. And what I want to impart to you in this brief talk of just 30 minutes is really something that probably took me about 12 months to arrive at. But I think I can do it. I think, I think we've all lived through a lot of what I was researching as a historical phenomenon. I think we've all been living through it very close in the past 12 months, the past several years, but certainly the last 12 months especially. So I think you'll start to recognize what I'm talking about as things you may have been looking at yourself and wondering about. But as a journalist, as an editorial writer, I became later and a columnist. I, 20 years ago, I've been doing this a very long time, 9-11 happens and I learn as an editorial writer at the Washington Times and a syndicated columnist, how difficult it is to have a conversation about Islam. Remember that? Going back to the 9-11 period, many of you probably were too young, but this was a really crazy period where any sort of, well, what I later styled grown-up conversation in the death of the grown-up, which addresses the same question, was met with 
invective and being shut down, what we now call canceled and censorship and losing your job and all the rest of it. And this really perplexed me. It was also sort of part of my own work and life because I was writing uh, columns and editorials about what was going on in the post 9-11 years became a subject of great interest to me and I wrote actually in a way two books about it. The first with the death of the grown-up, but what I did in American Betrayal, which um, because death of the grown-up wasn't really enough, death of the grown-up kind of looks at uh, the culture overall in terms of our own um, infantilization and how it's hard to come have these kinds of talks. It's really a gross simplification, but moving to the American Betrayal question, I I didn't think it was enough to sort of assign it to a fear factor. There had to be precedent, was there precedent really was my question, for this failure to be honest in a debate, in a, in a, in a conversation, in a public policymaking forum about something as important as Islam seemed to be at that time in terms of understanding it and dealing with wars in, in the Islamic world and all the rest of it, um, jihad, terror, etc. And I started finding precedent and it was very, I feel now looking back as, you know, what a, what a kind of naive time to even imagine that there couldn't be precedent for big lies in our, in our history. But um, such is the beginning of research, really. You start with a question and you try to answer it. And it's, it's actually good if you don't have any preconceptions, so long as you keep looking. And what I discovered was that there was precedent very similar to our inability to deal with Islam in a forthright manner. We had had a big problem dealing with communism. In fact, much of the, the invective that was thrown at people trying to have a conversation about Islam, remember the word Islamophobe, for example, um, which was a terrible thing to be called, people thought. Um, we used to have a word called red baiter. If you've tried to talk about communism and its incompatibility with constitutional liberty, you were a red baiter. And I noticed that there were similarities in the way these kinds of debates could be shut down through an emotional appeal, through a way of putting someone on the defensive, because immediately you say, I'm not an Islamophobe or I'm not a red baiter. And all of a sudden you're not talking about anything. You're just having a really silly kind of argument. And these kinds of similarities became stronger and stronger as I dealt into our history of uh, anti-communist truth tellers, people trying to get the truth out and what happened to them. This becomes a big important part of American betrayal. But it wasn't the beginning, right? I'm looking for the beginning. And if I get back to the 1950s and the period of Joseph McCarthy, everything you've been taught about him basically is a lie, I discovered. That wasn't the beginning either. So if we go from 2001 and we stretch back to the uh, post-war, post-World War II period, that's not the beginning. And I ultimately come up to the realization that we have to start thinking about these things, not as many people think as really something that came along with Barack Obama, right, in 2008 or 2009, or back to the 2000 period, the post 9-11 period, or even back to the 1950s. We have to start thinking about what I call it the red thread going back at least a century. And so this becomes a very wide lens to have on our on our history and, and how this these Marxist ideas and, and personalities have made their way through our institutions. And so in many ways, American betrayal is a series of really, um, it's almost part detective story because it, the way I came to this material was really in, in a state of curiosity and, and wonder, really, um, asking these questions, comparing it with contemporary events of the, say, first decade after 9-11 that I was dealing with as a columnist and, and American citizen, and, and, and trying to kind of make sense of when it is that we see ideology enter into the equation and no longer can we really expect a as clean as people can make it, but a relatively clean accounting of events. You know, I was trained as a journalist basically to answer those, those, those questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how. And we don't see that in our newspapers and media any longer. We, that, that's not even, that's not even on the table anymore. Everything is ideological today and everything is 
aimed at eliminating questions. Just look at what happens to Senator Ron Johnson for asking questions about vaccine safety, for asking questions about the why the, the perpetrators of the Black Lives Matter rioting in Washington, D.C. are all out and about and enjoying life, whereas the, the January 6 protesters, most of whom are on charges of glorified trespassing, are literally languishing in a gulag, an American gulag in Washington, D.C. He asks the questions, he gets, he gets smacked down in every way possible. He, 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 you know how this works. You probably remember the Trump years. It's not that long ago. Um, so this is sort of the atmosphere we're in where we expect this to a point where I'm afraid that we are all affected. I'm afraid we are all degraded by living in a world of big lies. And I want to talk a little bit about the history of big lies when they started. We can actually go back to the beginning and see it, which is something I was able to do in American Betrayal. And their impact on not just the fate of our country, but our, our, our personal spirit, our souls. I mean, this is something we all, especially young women working in Washington, D.C., are very aware of the parameters of acceptable debate. Having parameters of acceptable debate in the United States of America is not acceptable, but it's where we are because we have lost so much in the way of our, our freedoms. And this is something we all need to push back against. So I'm going to just say a couple of things that if I still lived, I, I am a refugee from Washington, D.C. I spent most of my life living there. I don't live there any longer. But if I were still in Washington and I said the following statements, I would be ridden out on a rail probably, depending on if I was in even slightly mixed political company. Okay, so if, if the, the big lie I'm going to put out there, in my view, is the COVID vaccine is safe and effective. Now, I think that's a big lie. My opinion is the COVID vaccine is an experimental gene therapy and by no means totally safe and effective. Now, that is considered absolutely verboten statement. Why is that? Why are we in a place where that is the truth? What, that is the situation. Or I can say the big lie that Joe Biden got more votes than any president in American history. Or I can say what I believe is true. The president is in Mar-a-Lago and the usurper is in Washington, D.C. Now, those are the kinds of statements that if I made them in a forum in Washington and expected to remain a, a, a card-carrying member of that forum, and I, I use that communist phrase, um, a little bit tongue in cheek, but a little bit not. Um, I, I, you know, I would, ha I wouldn't be able to go back on TV. I wouldn't be able to do this and that. And indeed, that that actually happened to me back in two thousand nine regarding Barack Obama and his socialist vision for America and my role at the time as a commentator on CNN, which is another story, uh, which I actually tell in American Betrayal as well, because I was mindful of these parameters throughout my career. They've just gotten more and more strangling. So with those couple of statements on the plate, and some of you may be thinking, that's outrageous, how could I say such things? Let's just remember what debate is all about and hearing the person out. Let me go back to the history of big lies, because it's really important that we understand what we're living amid. We hear the phrase a lot. Um, what does it mean? Of course, lying is part of humanity. We have a commandment against lying. We can't possibly believe that lies are anything new, and they're not. But the big lie is something in particular, and it has to do with the emergence of mass media. It's not just big tech in the past 10 years. It's not even uh, cable television. It's not even TV networks. It's, it goes back basically to around 1930, where we start really seeing national radio hookups, international reporting of a kind that had not really been feasible because of air travel, the, the rise of air travel and all the rest of it that, you know, it's hard to believe these things were actually new at one time, but they were. And certainly post-World War I, we saw this advance in technology. Uh, the, the, the explosion of radio because of World War I is part of it and airplanes and all the rest of it that I know that sounds very antique, but it's just true. So it created a new mechanism to deliver news. Well, you couldn't have a big lie without it. And the first big lie that uh, we can identify, and this is according to the great writer and historian Robert Conquest. If you don't know Robert Conquest's work on, on communism, familiarize yourself with it. He was also 
a, a really interesting poet. He was a, a very much a Renaissance man, but his most important work had to do with looking at what he called the terror famine in the Ukraine, which is in a phenomenon of the Soviet Union in the early 1930s. And so what we see with that, and you, you've probably heard a little bit about this in terms of what the New York Times and other news organizations did to deny that a, a, a state engineered famine was underway where Stalin literally was starving his political enemies to a point of murdering at least six million, at least six million lives were lost in what is known as the terror famine, which was this effort to break the food supply, break the uh, livelihoods, the self-sufficiency of the farmers in what used to be the breadbasket of the Russian Empire and much of Europe in, in the Ukraine, what was known as the Ukraine. Now, of course, it's the country of Ukraine. The media of the day, led by the New York Times, the Associated Press and others, did not report it. They reported it as malnutrition not associated with starvation, in the words of the New York Times, other, other crazy phrases to essentially soft sell the idea that there was this crime against humanity underway. And one mark of the, of the big lie also is that the truth may actually be abroad in the land. It isn't that there is no truth, it's just that the public square tends to embrace one narrative over others. And it, at that time, we had truth tellers, we had journalists even, we had, there was a famous journalist from England, Malcolm Muggeridge, there was also a man named Gareth Jones, you may have recently seen a movie about, that tells a bit of his story, it's, it's actually kind of a mixed bag, that movie in my view, but it, it highlights the role of this man to talk about what was really going on in, at this time, and it attracted a lot of attention, and yet, the states, oh, and the whole diplomatic corps of all nations was completely aware of what was going on with this famine in, that Stalin had engineered to destroy his political enemies and break the food supply. Unfortunately, we are seeing problems in our own food supply and efforts, efforts by various entities, World Economic Forum on down, to sunder us from self-sufficiency and farming today, which is very alarming that people may have questions about um, later. But basically, the, the impact of this and the impact of so many of these big lies had to do with advancing communism in the West and abroad, shoring up Stalin's regime, which did not have diplomatic recognition from the United States at this time. So if the media, if the left-leaning pro-communists um, in the media of the day were able to deny the famine, well, anything was possible, even recognition of the Soviet Union, which is exactly what happened on the heel of Stalin essentially starving to death six million people, FDR elected to do what four presidents and six secretaries of state before him did not refuse to do, and that was extend diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union. This was for me really the moral fall of our government because it, it was on the heels of this, this crime against humanity, and it was dependent on another big lie, which had to do with the agreement itself, which essentially asked the Soviet Union to promise not to subvert us, not to foment communist revolution in the United States. It was already doing it, and it would only do so more, which is really sort of where the America Betrayal story really picks up in the 1930s. So sticking with this point of recognition, imagine for a moment that at the end of World War II, on the heels of the discoveries that Hitler had liquidated six million Jews, imagine if the American government had elected to recognize the Nazi regime. That would be a moral abomination. Well, I argue that so it was in 1933. Now, that may be shocking to compare this comparison may be shocking, but I think that it's very important to understand how comparisons are essential to our understanding of ourselves, of our past, of our present, and how often it is the comparison that is denied to us. And I think that um, it's it's very, there was a great Polish philosopher named Joseph Makowicz who wrote, only by comparisons can objective knowledge be gained. So if you start with this in mind, 
you can't really, it's one of those things you can't quite unsee. And I would say that this is sort of a progression in American betrayal, but let's think tonight to 2021, 2020. Think about how coronavirus deaths are presented to us daily in the media. They are presented as if there is no other cause of death. Well, this is much the same as denying us the, the, the comparative knowledge we would have if we could compare coronavirus deaths to flu deaths, pneumonia deaths, cancer deaths, suicides as a result of lockdown deaths, drug overdose deaths, and all the rest of it. This is when you actually start understanding how information is muscled as a weapon against our, our ability to make judgments. Making judgments is so important to our, our, well, it's important as a basis of morality itself, but it's important as a basis of our, of our, of our all the decisions that we make. Um, this is the kind of, of correlation I see between the big lies of yesterday that divorce, say, Nazi crime from Soviet crime, or fascist national socialist crime, let us say, and Soviet socialist crime, um, using as a bar barrier something they call the collective good. Communism, we are told, is about the collective good. I mean, that's a lot of nonsense, but that's the PR. Well, don't we hear an awful lot about the collective good today vis-a-vis -vis the vaccination program, the collective good? When you hear too much about the collective good, you hear the talk of totalitarians because it is totalitarians that destroy our our treasuring of the individual, sanctity of life, uh, individual freedoms and liberties, it all gets run over. It all gets eradicated in this concept of collective good. And when you see statistics being used, you know that you're in totalitarian territory rather than cases, individuals. I mean, look again, I mentioned Senator Johnson. I've been thinking about him a lot lately. Look at Senator Johnson's press conference with uh, this week. If you haven't, seek it out while it's still available. He held a press conference to allow some among the vaccine injured to tell their stories. They had no idea there was a risk involved in vaccination. And these are mothers, wives, individuals who wanted to tell their stories because no one will. The media denies them and the, um, the government ignores them. A comparison we should make here, again, this notion of comparative knowledge. In the mid-1970s, we had a swine flu scare and the government rolled out a vaccine, a vaccine, more of a classic vaccine than this gene therapy we have today. And by the millions, millions of people were, were quickly vaccinated. There was this big fright of the swine flu, et cetera, et cetera. But lo and behold, we had 25 deaths that were thought to be linked to the swine flu vaccine and several hundred cases of terrible paralysis, the Guillain Barr syndrome. The government pulled the vaccine from public use. In other words, 25 deaths to them showed that it was a risky, it was a risky um, uh, medical intervention. So when we compare that to even the government's own figures coming out of CDC, we have over 6,000 deaths that surely merit further investigation. They seem to be linked to uh, the vaccines. We have over 30,000 grievous injuries. This is a place where you get back to this notion of safe and effective is a big lie. It's risky. You want to take it, take it. The government hasn't removed it. But the forcible vaccination ties in with this totalitarianization of our society, as did the whole lockdown regimen. Again, we have to go back to comparisons. One of the most important comparisons uh, that were never really made, we were not allowed to make, was the comparison between the uh, mortality rate of, of COVID and normal flu. And when we see that, um, according to uh, Professor Dr. John Unites of Stanford, a very eminent uh, epidemiologist, he has calculated that the typical seasonal influenza infection mort fatality ratio is 0.1%. Well, let's compare that to, by the government's own figures, the infectious fatality ratio on what is called COVID-19, 0.15%. So it's a little higher. This means that it is with it is more dangerous it is more dangerous than the average but it's not outside the norm and the, the the highest rate of mortality as you may have heard is among the older population 70 and up 
So the whole notion that there was any kind of lockdown justified by such a medical threat goes out the door when you can make that comparison. They don't, when the government is using information to manipulate you, comparison goes out the window. And this is a very important mechanism of information warfare, also known as big lies. So this is a very important thing to bear in mind because we are in this extremely hot battle for truth seeking, just the ability to get a second opinion. Remember in medicine where it was obvious, or it was not obvious, it was common practice to seek a second opinion when something was wrong with you. Now we're supposed to follow the science. That to me just reeks of the notion of party line. You follow, there is one science, since when was there one science? Since when was there one scientist? Since when was there a media organization who can deem science to be the one science you follow? I mean, the whole thing is so totalitarian that I am sure there are some of you anyway who have been thinking these same things and maybe weren't as clear on how it related, how long this whole process of really weaponizing information has been underway in our own country. I think, generally speaking, we have tended to think that communism was something that happened over there. Look at the uh, Victims of Communism Foundation. Everything that they do is oriented toward um, educating people about what happened in foreign countries that had communist subversion. They completely ignore the communist subversion that happened in our own country. And I've actually talked to them about this to no avail, but it's, it's, it's a glaring omission. And then you can't make the comparisons. You know, you can't find your way to a more objective understanding of, of history, of reality, of where you're going as a country and as a person. Um, so this is, this is, these are some of the things that I wanted to, to kind of bring across to, to the group. Um, I will say, just to give you a little bit more understanding of where American Betrayal really goes, it tries to go to the notion of how narrative is, is developed, how truth tellers are to be cherished and resurrected from our past. I, I, was, I was thrilled, but also saddened. I was thrilled to discover so many names in history that I did not know, and saddened to see how they had been essentially um, erased um, and taken from where they should be, which is in a pan an American pantheon, um, different truth tellers across, across these decades, these generations, and how the people who did the eradicating end up on the pedestals. I mean, it really is, it's a very inverted history that we are taught that we need to overturn to really understand ourselves, but also to protect ourselves today. And I think that this is really where the use of history is, is important because you can continuously have to start at, you know, where I started, you know, in, when I was starting this question, basically starting completely a blank slate because this history has been essentially stolen from us in many ways, just absolutely, again, erased, canceled is the word. And generally speaking, people who bring it up again find themselves in the, in the hot seat once again. So we have to figure out ways to, um, to regain our freedom of speech, our freedom of thought, our ability to have conversations that are grown up, that are rational, that are reason-based, to push back against the liars, to renounce the lies. I, I'd like to, I think, conclude, and we can talk if you have any questions now, with a quotation from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was, of course, the very famous Soviet dissident. He was an anti-communist. He was a, a very strong Christian. He suffered for years in the gulag for essentially writing a joke about Joseph Stalin when he was a soldier. And he wrote, of course, the very famous gulag archipelago. And one of the things he said, he said, he said many, many important things, but he said this one that I, I think is a good way to, um, well, it's a good way to live, but it's certainly a good way to end my talk, which is, if people renounce lies, they simply cease to exist. Like parasites, they can only survive when attached to a person. And I think that's a really powerful thought. Um, there is a problem when people don't know something is a lie. They may not know that they are essentially 
perpetuating a lie, but that is our responsibility to dig for the truth, to protect the truth, and to stand up for the truth. And you'd be amazed how quickly your enemies will fall off like the parasites that they are. It's, it's a process, it's difficult, it has setbacks, but I don't know where else we go at this point. I don't know where else we go. So if there are any questions, I am more than happy to, to answer them. Thank you so much. Also, it's lovely to hear great stories about Claire Booth Luce. So that was, that was a very fun surprise. So thank you for sharing that. Of course. Um, I know my boss always loves to hear the little ones that people tell around DC when we run into them. Um, may, I ask one, may I add one more story about her? Absolutely. Yes, this is something I was just looking her up. I, I've, she's at, she is in American Betrayal as well um, because she had tremendously good instincts about one of the villains of the book who was uh, FDR's uh, top aide. He wasn't really an assistant. He was, he was called the co-president at the time by people who oh. were upset by it. His name was Harry Hopkins. And there are some espionage experts who do believe he was a Soviet agent right there, not only working closely with Franklin Roosevelt during World War II and before and after, uh, well, Roosevelt was gone by then, of course, but in the war years, certainly, he actually lived in the family quarters of the White House during the most important years of the war. So this was a very important person, a very villainous person in, in my view, and I put together a dossier, essentially, of why people believe he was a Soviet agent the whole time, an agent of influence, not, not a conventional spy, but an agent of influence, which is the term of art. Um, but Claire Booth Luce knew him because he had uh, become a, a boyfriend or suitor, whatever you want to call him, a very serious boyfriend of a good friend of hers, um, an actress in New York. And when he, he left her very abruptly, he, he was kind of a climber, he ended up marrying someone else, and this poor friend of hers actually killed herself. She threw herself out of her apartment house on Central Park South. And the strange thing was that, you know, Claire Booth Luce could not stand Hopkins, but she ended up, she was running in these very rarefied circles and she ended up having a portrait done of her friend by the famous artist and communist, it's kind of a weird story, Diego Rivera, who drew, painted a picture of her friend in flight out of the apartment building, which is such a weird story. But when Claire Booth Luce got the portrait, she didn't know what to do with it. And she ended up putting it in her basement, which I just thought was one of these weird stories that you could never even imagine <laughs> as a fiction writer. It's such a strange story. But the main point is, is that she understood what communist subversion was. She was an opponent of Roosevelt's in 1944. He actually campaigned against her. And all these things are very important to me. But the main point I wanted to bring up was that in her maiden speech, she was a two-term Congresswoman, in her main speech, or maiden speech rather, to Congress in 1943, she coined a word, which we could use today really, which was globaloni. She appreciated the fact that the Roosevelt administration, including the vice president at the time, Henry Wallace, were looking toward a post-war period where American sovereignty was going to be essentially undermined and destroyed, which is exactly what happened until we get to Donald Trump. And she gave this wonderful speech that really put people back on their heels. It was her first speech as a politician. She'd been a famous playwright, of course, and mm -hmm. an actress um, and screenwriter. But um, I thought it was so interesting. I just found this out today that she was already onto the problems of globalism. Isn't that something? Yeah, that's, it's not surprising. She was a very wise woman, but yeah. it's, it's sad that um, I feel like we're still dealing with these same type of issues. Yes. And this is so many years later. In fact, I have like three questions coming through and they're almost all the exact same thing. So I'll just pick uh, one from Michael that says, how do you account for the continued appeal of communism in the US and the West, even after the revelations about Stalin and the suppression of the Hungarian uprising right up to the collapse of the Soviet Union? Everyone wants to know, why is it so appealing? What do you think? Well, I think this has to, it's a very good question. It, it perplexes everyone. I think that it has a lot to do with the successful subversion of the West, of the institutions. And I think that this is something that people, strangely enough, were, were, were somehow un, unaware of for most of these periods through the Hungarian uprising and Stalin's speech through um, the 1960s. When we get to the final dissolution of the Soviet Union, 
in, you know, in, in the 1990-91 period, what we see is a, 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 an absolute failure to declare victory um, over communism. There was already this, this retrenchment underway, and this is something I, I was perplexed by myself and go through in American Betrayal. The first meeting between President George Bush 41 and Mikhail Gorbachev, I have the transcript. At the time, the Bush Library had not released it. It was actually something that came out of Russia. It is shocking. It is a shocking transcript. There is so much effort to, to soft sell the, the appeal of liberty on, on the part of President Bush and being pushed as a point of policy by Mikhail Gorbachev and his top advisor, a man named Yakovlev at the time, or Yakovlev, I think is the name, at the time. And it it became um, evident to me as I was researching these things that there was simply a, a, a terrible fact that there was, there was so much softening of the West that had already been, already been affected through this period. I'm talking about a hundred year period. And this was something that I would just like to add the um, incredibly important testimony of the late great Vladimir Bukovsky, the, the co-founder of the Soviet dissident uh, movement in the Soviet Union, as a very young man, as a teenager, he was one of the most bravest men of, the, of all time, but certainly in the 20th century. He recently died just in uh, 2019, I think it is. Um, he uh, uh, was, uh, was a, I got to know him through American Betrayal. He wrote some very um, wonderful essays about it and the controversy about it, the effort to suppress my book um, that he took to heart um, and defended it. Anyway, he was uh, at the time actually trying to put communism on trial at the time the Soviet Union had its, its apparent fall. And he went back, he had such stature in the country that only he could really maneuver like this. He actually met with the then head of the KGB. They talked about having a trial. They wanted to open, he wanted to open archives, etc., and make sure that communism would be exposed once and for all. Not the people. He said, I don't want to just find out, you know, that everyone in the Soviet Union was an informer and put them in jail. It wasn't about that. It was the institution. It was the ideology. And this was at the time when Yeltsin was president. And what he found out as an advisor to Yeltsin, an informal advisor, someone privy to what was going on, he was given entree into the archives himself, completely untrammeled, no controls, and he assembled his own archive, which is an amazing thing. Um, but what he found out when they were proposing to put communism on trial, that there was opposition in all the Western governments. How do you like that? I mean, this was sort of this, it's in American Betrayal, that there are more details about this amazing episode because you would think that the Western world, which had ostensibly at least been purporting to fight communism in the Cold War for all of these generations, would wish to destroy the appeal, expose the crimes and all the rest of it. But there was institutional pushback and so much of this is about the complicity between Western institutions and communism that is documented only in part in American Betrayal, that there to reveal all would be to reveal so much complicity and they were essentially knit together. And I think this is part of what you actually go back, going back to Roosevelt, you actually get into this, this uh, political drive for what they talked about as convergence. I mean, look around you. We know our country has been socialized. Well, that started in full effect under Franklin Roosevelt. Much of our, it really was our second American revolution in the 1930s through the New Deal, which essentially put the government in so much control of so much uh, finance and marketing, uh, finance and industry and farming and so all the rest of it. It put the government in the seat of power in a way it had never been and has never never renounced it. It's only gotten worse. So when you actually start understanding convergence, the socialization of the Western powers, and the actual infiltration by either, you know, bona fide agents or just simply ideologues, uh, communist believers, fellow travelers, they call them people who want to get to the same place, even if they're not in a party structure, and all the rest of it, you start to see that there was really no desire to destroy communism because we were 
um, becoming communized and there was too much at stake to actually go back. And I think just to make one more point, I think that is why ultimately Donald Trump became such a lightning rod from the moment he became a clear threat to Washington as, as, pre as a presidential candidate and then of course president. I think it's because, and I, I wrote about this in the Red Thread, my, my most recent book um, about the anti-Trump conspiracy and the ideological uh, drivers there, which are, which are communistic, socialistic, um, one world, you know, things like that. He was our most anti-communist president. There's even Ronald Reagan was an internationalist, wanted to do the free trade stuff that Donald Trump was, was retrenching from and wanted to, you know, have American terms, uh, American beneficial terms attached to trade agreements, rebuilding the nation state, not going into multilateral types of organizations across the board. The nation state is the bulwark against communism. And so when you understand that that was what Donald Trump's agenda was all about coming into White House in 2016, you can understand why they had to throw everything they could at him and why there was essentially a rolling coup d'etat against him from the day he walked down, rode down the escalator to today. I mean, essentially, but certainly culminating on January 6th when he went dark. And um, that, that I think, I hope is something of an answer to the question. Okay, thank you. There's so many questions. So let's go right next to, how can we as young conservative women combat the big lies perpetuated by our university professor, professors in our lecture halls? What do we, what do they wanna, what do we do? Well, you know, it's, at this point, these universities, I don't think we should be involved in them. You know, I, I, I you know, it, the, the fight is not to expose Facebook as biased. And in this point, the fight is not to expose these universities as biased. I think that be, can become a complete drain on your energy and, and life. And so I've shifted in my own thinking on this. Um, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, happy to uh, take on a fight, but uh, the battleground, I think, needs to change. At this point, you know, I, I, I'm far away from, from university age, but I have... I have children who graduated recently. If I still had kids in college and the colleges were demanding vaccines as, as a condition of attendance, they wouldn't go. And I'm wondering if maybe the place to go is to look for colleges where free speech is still possible and leave the rotten ones to themselves. I mean, frankly, I mean that quite seriously. Consider changing your battlefield in order to prosper. All you need is, is an education. You don't need one of these horrible degrees. I went to Yale. I feel that way about Yale. I, honestly, it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's like a red guard occupied campus at this point. And I feel that way about most of upper education in this country. So seek out the so-called backwater campuses or the campuses where at least they let you talk and go there and, and, and learn what you need for life and make your friends and your connections that way. We need alternate alternate venues here. Okay. Someone else would like to know, how did so many Russian agents get into the U.S. government before World War II, and what was the environment that allowed that to happen? Well, that, that's a nice two-ball <laughs> question for me, because that's exactly what I discovered. I knew nothing. I just want to emphasize, I knew nothing when I went into this course of research. Um, and, you know, that's why the book is set up, sort of showing that I opened this door, and that led me to this door, and this door. So to give you my answer now, having gone through all these doors, basically, that point of recognition I mentioned, it's a date we're never taught, November 16th, 1933. I was never taught it, and I was I was close to being a hist I was an English major at Yale, but it was very close to history. I actually had left the department because it was so politicized, and I decided to read poetry instead, basically my senior year. But um, Roosevelt was very enamored of Stalin, and his administration was very far left. and And what happened at the point of recognition was to create was to take the um, to take the uh, uh, fear factor away from the far left in this country, from communists, pro-communists, fellow travelers, and Soviet agents. If you have Soviet agents forming cells in the US government, which is not a theoretical, it happened. 
you can look back at the uh, what they called the Ware Group. The Ware Group was something exposed by Whitaker Chambers, very famous ex-communist, ex-Soviet agent whose book Witness is still read. Um, and it's, it's a fabulous introduction to a lot of this um, underground that was in Washington. I used to go around and find the various addresses and places where these things were taking place. They saw the US government as something to be infiltrated. And when the Roosevelt administration came in and started expanding government, remember they called it the alphabet soup, all these new agencies and offices spring up. There was one, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, AAA, you know, all these different acronyms, alphabet soup. That one in particular became what they called a trap door into the government and they were able to move people in, literally. When Whitaker Chambers came to Washington, his job was to start helping agents get into the, the more important departments like the State Department. The State Department, believe it or not, used to have anti-communists or what you might call communist realists in it, who, men who had looked at, watched and witnessed the Russian Revolution, had moved into the Baltic states, had files and, and newspaper archives and understandings of what, what communism was, what revolution was, it's sort of a strange idea to think of the State Department as being a conservative type organization or a patriotic organization, but it was. And at this point, when Chambers comes to Washington in 1934, he is um, charged with getting Alger Hiss into the State Department, Alger Hiss being a young Soviet agent. So this was possible because people could move in these circles now that we had recognition. The Soviet embassy was like a, the, it's that building that's, um, that's now, I think, the residence very close to the White House on 16th Street, right next to the University Club. That was the old Soviet embassy. It's now their residence, I believe. Now they've got that massive information surveillance outpost up on Wisconsin. But that used to be open. I have read, I find it hard to believe. It was open 24 hours a day and the caviar and the champagne flowed after recognition. And it was like a social place to meet and greet and make connections. And people did. And it, it, it was just, that was the atmosphere. The, the, um, the government was seriously being socialized. And so in and among all these people, they used to call them parlor pinks was the uh, slang for socialist. You could have hardened Soviet operatives moving in this kind of red sea, if you will, and moving into government posts. And they did, and they did it by the hundreds, if not the thousands. And one thing to bear in mind is, we know about the Ware Group, which had access to about seven different um, departments, I think it was. Um, we know about another group that was called the Perlow Group. Um, but what many of these key defectors and, and people involved at the time believed was that there were many other cells that were never broken. So in other words, because we had the defector Whitaker Chambers, because we had the defector Elizabeth Bentley, who was a very important witness also, we knew about these two groups, but they believed, and others, including um, Soviet defectors, believed that there were as many as seven other groups nine groups. I mean, you had various estimates of how many groups were unbroken, but imagine that when you think about the notoriety of a few of these spies, imagine how many others may well have never been exposed. So that's how it happened. Um, it is, you know, many crimes of the century. And the thing that I, I do in American Betrayal, um, which really hadn't been done on such a scale before, which is kind of a kind of a shocking thing for me to say, but it's true in the sense that what I tried to do was take these revelations that had been confirmed from Soviet archives, you know, KGB cables that were famously published in starting in the mid 1990s or late 1990s and actually identify, you know, these people, they're confirmed. We've known that so and so Lachlan Curry, for example, a top aide to FDR was a Soviet agent to take one example and try to see what they did. In other words, it's not enough to say, oh, there's one, there's one, there's one. Look how many there are. Isn't that terrible? It's sort of more important to say, well, what was his portfolio? Oh, it was China? Oh, Mao rose in China? I mean, what, you know, what are the connections here? You know, what did they actually do in a policymaking and then, of course, war-making role? Because remember, this subversion goes through World War II and beyond. 
Um, but it, it, the war making becomes another vector of essentially Soviet policy when it's in the hands of agents loyal to Stalin. So we have to kind of reimagine everything that happened. And, and that's much of what I try to do in American Betrayal. And it's destabilizing, you know, it's shocking. I was shocked and destabilized throughout the writing of it. And I hear from a lot of readers who are too, but it's um, something I think we have to face. And, uh, you know, it, it, it only continues. Well, I think I can just only say, wow. And, <laughs> oh dear. Because um, <laughs> we have so many other questions. Um, you're, you're very popular. Um, what is the role of Hollywood in the communist socialism influence we experience today? Well, it's, it's again, getting back to this idea of the rise of mass media. I may have neglected to mention the rise of movies. Movies are, are at least as important, probably more so, than the rise of mass news media that would also coincide with, you know, 1930 is a good date. We've seen the rise of Hollywood. We get talkies, uh, speaking motion pictures, as they called them, back in 1929. So it, it fits with this timeline of big lies. And, this, and the power of, of movies and visual mass media was well known to Lenin and Stalin, particularly Hitler as well. Um, think of the importance of Lenny Riefenstahl, the, the Nazi filmmaker, to the Nazi um, regime. And, and the, the Soviet artists who were so important to perpetuating the um, stories. And let's talk about Hollywood. Hollywood had a communist pro problem. Ronald Reagan as president of the Screen Actors Guild was worked and fought these people and learned so much about communism in his acting career um, that stood him in good stead as he moved into politics and educated him in ways that very few Americans have been educated. So Hollywood was a very important place. I write about Hollywood as well in, in the book because the, um, the narratives there are set in such a way as to perpetuate all the communist doctrine. One of those narratives is, is set not so much by what they show you, but by what they don't show you. And one of the most fascinating things I came across when I was working on the Hollywood section of American Betrayal, which actually got kicked off one of my first uh, columns for the Washington Times was about the late director and producer Ilya Kazan, who was being given a special Oscar in the late 1990s. And he, um, he was being castigated as a rat, an informer, a uh, fink all, all over again, because he had decided he'd been a communist in his early career in the 1930s. And at a certain point when American representatives, elected officials were trying to figure out what the heck happened to us, how we got infiltrated, he decided it was more important to tell the truth than to protect the communist conspiracy that was literally trying to take down our country. So he made the moral decision to go and testify about what he'd seen and, and known and, and been with, wor worked with in the 1930s. And Hollywood never forgave him, even though he won Oscars and made great movies that you know are considered you know, very important film and, and, and also plays and so on. He was just a tremendously important uh, figure in the industry. And as I was writing about him and also the director, Edward Dimitrik, I actually got to meet uh, Kazan as a result and, and talk to Edward Dimitrik before he died as a result of what I was writing because most people weren't doing this kind of revisionist work. Um, it led me into the understanding of what really went on in Hollywood. And one of the things I learned had to do with one of the most famous member or the sort of most accomplished member of what they call the Hollywood 10, these um, uh, uh, filmmakers who wouldn't cooperate in these investigations to find out who was literally a spy for Stalin. I mean, why is that considered a moral position? It's just, you know, amazing. They don't want to inform, inform on the man who's responsible for killing tens of millions of people. I don't, I don't understand that, but that's part of the information war we're subjected to. Um, this was uh, Dalton Trumbo, and he actually was bragging in the pages of the Daily Worker, which was the communist daily organ, the communist party supported by Moscow's daily organ in America at the time. He was bragging about the fact that they, communists in Hollywood, were able to keep the most dramatic and liter literary and, and appealing communist novels from being made into movies. 
So part of what Hollywood did, the communists in Hollywood were able to do, and these would be people who read scripts, who were agents, who you know, worked in the industry, not necessarily at the top level, but you know, the middle level people, they were able to keep the properties that told the stories of suffering in the Soviet Union or drama of, of, of anti-communists and so on from the silver screen. And later on, I mean, think about how many movies you may have seen in your own life, if you watch old movies, that actually had any sort of drama about the, the, uh, the white army, the anti-communist army in, in the um, Soviet Union, or the escape from a gulag of, of someone else, or, you know, someone who fled the underground, like a Whitaker Chambers, I mean, or someone who left Cuba in a boat, or, you know, there's, or someone who, who went through the, the Berlin Wall who, you know, may have been shot and killed at the end, the dramatic moment. My father was a novelist. He wrote some of these stories himself and came up against these uh, anti-communist witch hunts himself in Hollywood. Um, this is the kind of thing that was not dramatized. So that's something we don't usually think about as far as Hollywood's role. And then, of course, the soft selling was a little more obvious. Uh, Mission to Moscow was a very uh, uh, famous and, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, kind of a, an apologetic for the, the blood purges, if you can imagine that, by a, a former ambassador to the Soviet Union, Joseph Davies, who worked for Franklin Roosevelt. Um, that was a famous movie that really was just a Stalinist dreamboat kind of thing. So there was propaganda all across the board, and also there was this control so the American people did not become as familiar with what was going on um, in reality with communist revolutions and subversion. And that's a really important part of the story that people often miss. So I'm, I'm glad to have the question to mention that. Do you, where are we at today with Hollywood? Gosh, <laughs> I think Hollywood is kind of, um, it seems like with so many things that we used to share in as a nation, I personally, maybe it's just because I'm old now, and <laughs> I, I, I feel like we, we've become atomized in the sense of, you know, uh, we've become so fra fragmented. I don't, I think Hollywood is, is, is almost beside the point, and, and you may tell me differently, maybe it's still incredibly influential. They certainly think they are, but there's, there's a jokey aspect to it now when you see these radical influencers on social media. I mean, I suppose the followings are still something you have to take very seriously, but I think that the main problems are not coming out of Hollywood propaganda. They are following the propaganda, mm -hmm. the, you know, the big problems we face, uh, the big villains we face, for me, are the information organs, namely the news media, the propaganda organs, and um, the big tech, of course, control of our, uh, our speech and our, our lives, and the government piggybacking on it, criminalizing political uh, discussion, beliefs, um, you know, turning it into a terrorist threat, this kind of thing. This is more important. Hollywood is following along more in my view, but I could, I could be wrong on that, but that's my, my sense as someone who, I used to be a movie critic, believe it or not, and as I mentioned, my dad was a Hollywood writer and novelist, and my, my grandfather was in vaudeville and worked for MGM uh, mm -hmm. theaters, so, you know, I, I definitely have a very, um, uh, a, a predilection for movies and, and, and entertainment that comes right through my family, but I feel like it, I don't partake of it anymore. I'm so disgusted by it. And again, you know, like with the universities, we need alternate forms. We need new blood. We need different venues and we need our own. Um, so that, that would be my general statement there. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a debate that many people have of whether, you know, you know, they say people some say politics is downstream of culture and then there's just ways of you know well is, is this setting up a culture if it's acceptable and then it's you know some are some argue that it's you know k-12 through education that allows these types of things about proper education you can't actually expect you know we haven't talked about education you're right that is number one education is number one that's the seed of all these problems because you can't you can't have any of these things that I've been talking about succeed unless you have been brainwashing the population. Again, not since Barack Obama, not since 
you know, this is a hundred year or more, it's a longer project than a hundred year, um, uh, but it's certainly a hundred year project to uh, uh, really communize our education system. People think everything was great until the 1960s, for example, where they start seeing uh, revolution on campus, but but the truth of the matter is that you start seeing communist um, agitators, true agitators, uh, party members, secret party members, entering the education system as teachers, going back to the 1920s very actively. So this is even before recognition, and there's a really interesting uh, time frame between say 1939 and 1941 when uh, Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler are allies during the Nazi Soviet pact. So it's before we enter World War II. And in this time frame, it was all right to be a public figure investigating communist infiltration because even though we think it's bad today, it was bad then in terms of you could not say bad things about communism in a number of these uh, kinds of uh, uh, institutions and in the public square, there was great pushback already, even if the most people were still anti-communist in this country and, and very opposed to the Russian Revolution, for example. But in this time frame, in New York State, which of course was the major entry point from for immigration from Europe, from the old Russian Empire, from the you know World War One refugees and all the rest of it, you already find through investigations by the New York State house, state government, that the New York school system and college system and high schools were already deeply inf infiltrated by communist teachers. And it's one of the most important investigations, very little known, that was ever done by an investigating body, you know, of elected representatives. It's called the Rap Kudert hearings. And what they uncovered was Shock! I read. I only studied it after I wrote *American Trail*. It is amazing, but it's all. If you're thinking by 1940-41, New York was already in this under this kind of uh, potential influence. That's a long time ago, right? We we don't think of the 1940s as being anything but very patriotic education-wise, but not true. And this actually, they got it on paper, and then going forward, you saw different hearings on Capitol Hill into the same problem, you know, really going after World War II, we had to stop all that during World War II, but after World War II through the Cold War, you see some very um, significant hearings, investigations by these great American patriots elected to office in that time who really put it all down on paper. I mean, we have the records, we know what was going on, but again, all of this is kind of erased from our understanding of the past. We're supposed to look at that and think, oh, that was a bunch of paranoid um, red baiters, right? Who, who made a big deal over just free thinking, you know, fuzzballs. I mean, that's how we're supposed to look at the period, but absolutely education is very important and different agreements, strange agreements between America and the Soviet Union on education are very disturbing. Charlotte Isserbeit's work is very, very important in all of this. So yeah, big subject, could do a whole nother, whole nother talk on it. Well, we would request a book if you have the time. <laughs> um, but we're right, coming up on our time. The last question we usually like to ask is, um, what books are you reading lately? Or what do you recommend that young women read to just better inform themselves? We obviously recommend this book and the other ones written by Diana West. But what else? What have you been reading? Well, I tell you what I've been reading. And I, I really appreciate that question as well. And I appreciate um, the recommendations of, of my books, too. Um, but I've been struggling to understand what has happened to us in this past year, the election uh, that was stolen and the corona uh, dictatorship that we are now suffering with. And I learned a lot about the Great Reset from the World Economic Forum's own websites. And so many of these things seem to be in, in play. And it's a, it's a very destabilizing time. I would say as a blanket statement, nothing is normal. Don't pretend anything is normal. Don't get back to normal. This is not normal. And I don't mean getting back to your lives and your friends and all that stuff, which is that, you know, new normal that we're supposed to be in. I'm talking about politically, existentially. We are, I believe we are in a dictatorship at this point. I believe we have had a long revolution, very different from 1917, very different, but the same end. So what I've been reading 
for the past several, many months really, I've been looking at post-revolution literature by Russians who went through what I think we're going through. And I, 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 um, it's probably an essay I should write about some of the books I've been reading, but I literally wanted to know what it was like when everything was overturned. And for example, what I mean by that is we have lost our Bill of Rights. We don't have freedom of speech. We don't have freedom of assembly. We don't have freedom of worship. All these things were taken in the name of our health, which is a complete crock and a deception, a terrible deception. And how did that happen? And it didn't just happen here. It happened in the different, you know, for obviously they don't have bills of rights, but you know, the different liberties that were enshrined in the different uh, democracies around the world. Everyone's lost their rights. How did that happen? Where, so looking at it as a revolution, I was reading a writer, oh golly, what's the name of his book? Ivan Bunin, or Bunyan is his name. He wrote a book called uh, revolutionary days I believe I can get you a title if you're interested but he wrote a diary of living through the Russian Revolution I found fascinating and horribly um, familiar in certain in certain ways um, I have also been reading a book that is very sad to me but fabulous I really do recommend it if you have anything like my bent for this kind of thing it's the title i'm sort of embarrassed to tell you because it's my daughters would make fun of me for titles like this It's called hope abandoned <laughs> which is a terrible title but it kind of is her the, her, the woman's name is nadia mandelstam mandelstam and she was the wife the widow of a russian poet who was who was uh purged in the late 1930s and she has this remarkable recall of her life and times that again is talking about the loss of freedom of speech, the way writers in the 1920s in the new Soviet Union were um, utterly upended. They didn't know what to do for a while. They, they couldn't write. They, they felt the state. They felt the pressure to conform. They felt all these things that, frankly, I feel today. I have been writing all my life. I actually, I don't know if I'll ever write again. I, I you know, it's one of these times where you're just trying to get your legs again. And so that's a book I, I, it's very long and I'm still reading it. Um, so that's a very, those are two very heavy books I've been reading. I also was looking at Bunyan's short stories, which are really lyrical and beautiful. So that's a little bit of relief. And, um, you know, I, I um, those are kind of some of the things I've been reading. I have also, I would like to just say that I don't know how the remarks I made about the vaccine go, went over, but I would just like to say what I've been reading about that because it's not in the media. I go on Telegram every day and I look at COVID vaccine injuries because I think it's really important to sensitize myself to this kind of suffering of individuals mounting numbers now that is being suppressed in the media. And the reason I say that, and I found actually a precedent here, I was looking at there was an essay by the great writer Arthur Kessler, who was another ex-communist, and he was writing about how people in 1940s America didn't really have an ability to understand, the, appreciate the atrocities that were happening at the time in Nazi Germany. And so he wrote this piece, I can't remember the name of it, but he talked about this concept of the screamers who were sensitized to it, who'd either come out as refugees or you know, somehow had a real sense of what was going on or experience. And that they were trying to tell people what was going on. And he talked about this one lecturer who was an American publisher who would literally spend 20 minutes before he went on to give a talk, imagining that he was about to face a firing squad or about to be, you know, suffering gas poisoning or some horrible death. He would literally try to imagine himself in that position before he gave a talk. And I thought, my gosh, that's kind of what I've been doing. So I've been looking there, and I've also been reading Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s website, uh, The Defender. Now, I didn't know, you know, I had, I, Robert Kennedy Jr. is considered a big liberal, etc. He's a very brave and articulate, and I deeply respect him. I've been reading him for a long time now, and I may not agree with everything he says, but I deeply respect him. He's amazing. And his website, The Defender, is following a lot of what the media is not, and that means Wall Street Journal, Breitbart, to MSNBC, CNN. We have no media on these really important issues related to the, the sort of COVIDian cult and um, the election fraud. You know, we don't have media on this. We have to go to other outlets. So those are the things I've been reading, and um, 
I'm happy if anyone has further questions, I'm happy to communicate by email if anyone wants to continue anything or didn't get a chance to ask. So just check with Julie on that. But I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk to you today. And I hope, I hope that you're all um, thinking hard and, and, and invigorated here, because I am. It's very nice to have this opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming. I feel like my head is spinning just a little bit because of all of the history and facts, but I do think that I'm going to keep reading um, and just digging more, dig in more to the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. I think that's probably something that I missed uh, personally. So yeah, I'm, Me too. Yeah, so I'm going to be doing more of that. We really appreciate your just detailed work on the history. So thank you so much. Thank you for speaking to us today, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.